Welcome to Let's Talk Micro. Hello everyone. Um, hope you all had a great week and uh, I also hope you enjoyed the last episode about gram stains. If this is your first time listening in, welcome. Please make sure you listen to the previous episodes about media and an introduction. On the last episode we went over gram stains. So we spoke about how to prepare the smear based on the source. We went over the components of a gram stain, but let's go ahead and go over them real quick. So with your gram stain, you have four components, four uh, reagents. You have your crystal violet, which is your primary stain, right? You have your iodine, which is the fixative, the mordant. You have your decolorizer and you have your saffronin, which is your counter stain. So you start with your crystal violet, which is your primary stain, like I said. You add it to your slide. You let it sit for one minute. Then you wash it with water. You add your iodine. You let it sit for one minute. And what does the iodine do? Well, you know, it binds to the alkaline dye. You wash that with water, and then you decolorize. You know, this is something that you're going to perfect with time and repetition, but you can add the decolorizer for like three to five seconds. Some people just add the drops until they see the purple wash away. Or I mentioned another technique you can try with the slide lying flat, you add your decolorizer and then wait three to five seconds. And then you wash with water. And then finally, you add your saffronin, which is your counter stain, and you leave that from 30 seconds to one minute. Wash with water, and then let your slide dry. And then we also mentioned last week about, we talked about the difference between gram positive and gram negative, right? If you remember, gram positive bacteria, they have a thicker, cell wall you know they have a thick peptidoglycan wall and that makes them they retain the first stain the first dye which is the purple and then gram negative bacteria they have thinner walls so the first dye goes away when you decolorize and then you end up retaining your last stain which is your saffronin and that's your pink and that's the difference between gram positive and gram negative bacteria. So now that your smear is ready, it is time to take it to the microscope. So if you're in this field, I mean, even if you're in college and you're taking a, a micro class or some other sort of science class, by now you know the parts of the microscope. So I'm not going, I'm not really going to go into detail about them, but I'm going to mention. In microbiology, the main objectives that we use are the 10x, which is your low power, and then you use our 100x, which is your oil immersion. There are some microscopes that have the 50x, which is also an oil immersion. The 40x, which is the high dry, we use it if we're doing like um, maybe a web prep or a KOH. But with gram stains, it's 10x and 100x. Um, and that's something that I've seen that is challenging when you are going through school for the medical laboratory sciences. You know, if you're taking microbiology, you're taking your analysis. In your analysis, you know, your, your microscopic urines, they're done on 40x. So sometimes, you know, it, it takes a while for you to get that process going where like you're, you know, you're doing urines, you're using that 40X and then you go to micro class and the next thing you know, you're getting oil all over your 40X. And those of you that perform microscopy know what I'm talking about. You know, it happens. You know, sometimes we all do it. You know, just the important thing is that Make sure you clean that 40X, take off that oil. And that's something that I also see in students that when 
They say, hey, um, my smear looks weird. And then when you go over to the microscope, they actually, they have their slide on the 40X. So it, it looks distorted. You know, it just happens. Also, sometimes something that I've seen is that those are, let's just back up a little bit. So when you are having trouble, because since I mentioned that, you know, like the, the image distortion, when you're having issues finding the organisms or what you inoculated on your smear, these are some things that you can check. A lot of times, do you have it on 100x? That's one. Um, if you have it on 40, like I said, you're not going to see a clear image. Number two, do you put oil? Number three, this one I've seen more. Um, it's your slide, the right side up. You know, you can actually see on 10x but what you inoculated, but then when you switch to 100, you don't see anything. That's going to happen if your slide is upside down. You know, that's what I think is, it, it happens. Um, if, so if you go, if, if you're still having trouble after you check these, you know, your slide is right side up, you're in a hundred X, you have oil. What I recommend is, you know, you go back to 10 X, focus on some lettering that has the slide that the slide has. Um, get that into focus and then move to the area where you inoculate it. And once you get that into focus, add your oil and switch to 100X. And you should be able to see a better image, a clear image. You should be able to find what you're looking for. So just to recap, two main objectives that we use, 10X, which is low power. We use 100X, which is oil immersion. With 10X, you focus, you, know, you bring your slide to focus, and then once you do that, you add your oil and switch it to 100. And that's where you actually perform, that's where you actually look for your, your organisms on 100X. And like I mentioned, there's a 50X, which is also oil immersion. And that's very helpful when you have, um, it's good practice to, when you're looking at 100, bring it to 50, so you can scan your slide for yeast. A lot of times you have yeast in very small amounts. And with the 50X, you might be able to, you know, you see a larger field of view. And that way you, you rule out a yeast. And that happens a lot with blood cultures. You know, when your blood culture, you might have a small amount. You might think it's negative, uh, but it's yeast. And those of you that work in micro, uh, so with the blood culture system, right, you collect the blood in bottles and you put them in an instrument and that measures, you know, it's like a, it measures the, a change in color as gas is produced. So basically the bottom of your bottle is green and then it turns yellow. And that's a, when you have a positive blood culture. But when you have yeast, your bottle is green. And a lot of times you have very small amounts of it. So this is where doing a cytospin helps. And also using that 50X. Just to make sure that you don't call it NOS, which is no organism seen. Put the bottle back in the instrument. When in reality, there was a yeast in there. And also when, um, just going back real quick, when you can find what you're looking for, um, sometimes, you know, you might have not fixed the slide well enough. So if all the things that I mentioned before do not work, uh, just go ahead and repeat your slide. You know, yes, I know it is frustrating that when we're so busy in micro, we have to go back and repeat things, but hey, that's the way it is, right? Um, our patients come first.
Uh, also, when using the microscope, I want to talk a little bit about light. With a gram stain, you can see so much better with your condenser up. Condenser up and bring the light up. A lot of times I've seen plenty of uh, new techs and students that they actually they have a, the condenser all the way down. A micro condenser up works best. And then now that you finally got your slide into focus, then what are we looking for? So let's start talking about morphology and arrangement, right? Morphology, the shape of the cells, um, arrangement, you know, the way that they are together. A particular morphology and arrangement can be specific to certain species of bacteria, right? So let's start with morphologies. We have cocci, we have rods, uh, we have cocobacillary, and then for arrangements, we can have clusters, chains, pairs, palisades. So let's talk about gram-positive cocci in clusters, like I just mentioned. A particular morphology and arrangement can be specific to certain species of bacteria. So gram-positive cocci in clusters, uh, it indicates that you have Staphylococcus, Micrococcus, and Aerococcus, for example. Out of those three, the most common being uh, Staphylococcus first, then Micrococcus, and then last, Aerococcus. Gram-positive cocci in chains indicates that you have a strep, right? Streptococcus pyogenes, Streptococcus agalactiae, uh, Streptococcus viridens. Uh, you can also have strep, you know, gram-positive cocci in pairs, uh, like a like a Streptococcus pneumoniae. And then you have some arrangements that the gram positive rods have. Uh, you have coriniform, branching. Um, another morphology of gram positive rods is boxy. So when you have a boxy morphology, uh, this indicates that you're probably dealing with a bacillus. I'm talking about gram positive rods. If you have a coriniform, which is like a snapping division, uh, you have corinobacterium. And then branching, you can have uh, like an actinomyces. And this is for gram-positive rods. Then from your gram-negative rods, I mean, you can have, normally, you know, you can have like a rod shape. Um, you can have, you know, um, Cocobacillary shape. You know, a great example is Haemophilus, Pastorella. Uh, so, I mean, the word kind of says it, Cocobacillary. So it's kind of between a cocci and a, and a bacillus. With Haemophilus, Haemophilus, they tend to be very tiny. A lot of times you actually have a hard time telling what it is. You're like, is it cocci? Is it rods? When you have that situation, that presentation, um, in all likelihood, we are, you are dealing with a hemophilus. I've seen texts and I've seen students that they, have one, they, they experience this. They have like a hard time telling what it is. And yeah, it ends up being hemophilus. And like I mentioned, pastorella, it's also cocobacillary. I love pastorella. I don't know. There's something fascinating about it. I mean, it just doesn't grow mac. Normal flora and animals. You know, cats, dogs, pigs. Um, also, cocobacillary, but larger. You can have a acinetobacter. 
and there's something very interesting about acinetobacter. It is a gram-negative rot, but they're like plump cocobacilli. And a lot of times, they tend to stain purple. So beware. This is, this is why in micro, everything's about repetition, practice. You know, you have to put all the clues together. Acinetobacter is one of the bacteria that gets reported the most as gram-positive cocci. Because, you know, you're looking at your slide, maybe it was under decolorized, it ends up purple, and sometimes even if you did it well, it likes to retain that purple, maybe because it's so thick. So beware. And it's a very typical presentation. Initial gram stain goes out as two, three plus gram positive cocci. Next thing you know, the next day, you have growth on blood, chocolate mac, and you have an acinetobacter. So you have to be very careful because, right, a treatment option, uh, the treatment between a gram positive cocci and a gram negative rod is different, right? There are patterns of intrinsic resistance. So you have to be careful when you're, act when you're doing these gram stains. Which brings, uh, before I finish the morphology and the arrangements, a good indicator that you did a good, that your stain was good, is your white blood cells. Your white blood cells should be, let's say gram negative, I'm gonna mean, they end up being pink. So, if you have purple cells, purple white blood cells, uh, your stain is under decolorized. So you should be careful when you have this presentation. Um, so also with the, with the morphology, you also have gram negative cocci. You know, you have your gram negative diplococci, like your moraxella, your Neisseria, and then you can also have, uh, Valonella, which is a gram negative cocci, but is anaerobic, is an anaerobic. You know, a few years ago, it used to be very rare for you to encounter it. And now as time goes on, I think I've, I've seen it more and more. So that used to be like the, like the zebra. You know, like they say when you hear hooves, you know, think horse, not zebra. Meaning that you probably have one of the most common bacteria versus the, the uncommon. But nowadays I've seen it increase more and more in blood cultures, especially. So you have to keep that in mind when you're doing gram stains. So we talked about morphology, we talked about arrangement. We already mentioned some species, right? We talked about a staph or strep. Um, our gram negative rods, I said I mentioned the like Acinetobacter, Pastorella homophilus, your Enterobacteriaceae, you know, your E. coli, your Salmonella, your Proteus. So now that we know about that, we also talked about you know, gram positive rods, right? Your Bacillus. You're going to have your Lactobacillus. So now that we know all this, we have a good stain. We checked, we did everything properly. So what are we looking for? How do we report this? Okay, so we definitely, when we're doing a gram stain, we're looking for white blood cells, and to be more specific, polymorphonuclear neutrophils, or PMNs. We're looking for bacteria. And in the case of a sputum, which we'll talk more about that later, uh, we're looking for epithelial cells. No, skin cells. So those are the three things that we're looking for. Uh, you know, you examine, you start using the low power for your cells. And for your bacteria, you use the oil immersion. Always focusing on 10x. And then switching to 100. 
and we should examine about 20 to 40 fields. And these are some of the guidelines that I'm using. They're actually um, from the American Society for Microbiology, which they have no affiliation to this podcast. So under the low power field, which is your 10x, we're looking for our white blood cells. Um, so if you have less than one per low power field, that's called one plus, or some places might say rare or occasional. If you have one to nine cells, that's a two plus or few. If you have 10 to 25, that's a three plus or a moderate. And if you have greater than 25, that's four plus or heavy. And this applies to epithelial cells, PMNs, the neutrophils, RBCs, red blood cells, and whole cellular material. And then for your bacteria, and also this includes yeast, if you see less than one per oil immersion field, that's a one plus. If you see one to five, that's a two plus. If you see six to 30, that's a three plus. And if you have greater than 30, that's a four plus. So yeah, so the cells in low power from one through four plus, right? Less than one, one to nine, 10 to 25, greater than 25 for your bacteria and yeast you no know, saying one plus two plus three plus four plus which is less than one one to five six to thirty and greater than thirty and then in addition uh describe when you're talking about bacteria or yeast describe the morphology so for your gram positive, you have cocci. You can say if it's pairs and chains. Um, you can say clusters. If you have for your bacilli or your gram positive, if they're large, small, branching, um, corineiform. For your gram negative, diplococci, bacilli. Uh, you can also say gram variable for your yeast. You can say you can say budding yeast cells or pseudo hyphae. Just keep in mind, you know, with these guidelines that the ASM or the American Society of Microbiology, um, no affiliation to the podcast. Don't don't just make be sure that if the morphology is distinctive, go ahead and report it. You know, don't commit to something that you're not sure because then it's a lot of work and and most important you're reporting something wrong so if you're saying gram positive cocci in clusters but then it was not actually a gram positive cocci in clusters like i say you have a a strep growing but just because Maybe the cells were clumped together, you know, they were, and then you thought there were clusters. So you're telling the doctor that you have possibly a staph, which is the most common, when in reality you might have a strep. So if the morphology is not very distinctive, just go ahead and report it as gram positive cocci. That's an example. Um, also very important, if you try your staining and for some reason, you know, like you already repeated your slide and you're getting gram variable, which means that you, you don't know if it's positive or negative, it is acceptable to call it gram variable. You know, that's better than you calling it something that it's not. Uh, you know, like you should always, when you have the situations, of course, you know, always consult with another technologist, someone more experienced. 
But the reality is that a lot of times you end up working in some small lab. Now, there are a lot of small labs in the country where maybe it's just you on the shift. Or maybe they do very little gram stains. So at that point in time, maybe the highest person in knowledge, let's say, might be someone that it also might, you know, it might not have as much experience either. So be safe in that case and just report a gram variable. And then when it grows on the plate, you can always change it back. Don't commit yourself to something that you're not 100% sure of because you can put the patient at risk, right? A lot of times when you have gram variable rods, most of them, they end up being um, gram positive, that they're actually, you know, the, maybe due to medication, the cells are breaking the cell wall is the deteriorating and then some of that initial dye might wash away and some of that last counter stain might get in so that's what i'm saying just be careful sometimes you know less is, is more in that sense because if you end up saying oh yeah i have a gram negative rod when you had a gram positive rod or the other way around it's definitely you know, the treatment options are are different. And a lot of times, you know, with your gram positives, most of them end up being like skin flora, whereas the gram negative rods, they're definitely more significant. So there's a big difference. So if you're not sure, just call the gram variable, then the next day it grows on the plate. And then you, you know, you update your report. And that's it. So we went over the guidelines, and um, so let's say that I'm I'm scanning my fields, I'm on 10x, and I see maybe let's say an average of seven PMNs per low power field. So that will be a two plus. And then let's say that I see maybe six to thirty gram positive cocci in clusters. So that will be a three plus. So my report will go out as two plus PMNs, three plus gram positive cocci in clusters. When you don't have anything, like you don't see any organisms or you don't see any white blood cells, PMNs, then it'll be no PMNs. NOS, which is no organism seen. So, good example, let's say that you don't find any white blood cells, but you do see an average of two gram negative rods per oil immersion field. So, you will report that as no PMNs, two plus gram negative rods. And then the other way around, let's say that you saw an average of 11 PMNs, but you did not see any bacteria or yeast. So that will go out, will go out as three plus PMNs, no organism seen. And that's it. Sometimes, you know, when you get with the organisms, when you get to the point that some there's like rare that you might maybe see one or two around instead of calling it right away you can just document it internally and then wait to see if it grows in the plate that's only in sources that are not critical don't do that with a csf i mean if you see a little bit of something that looks like a bacteria in a csf repeat your slide and then if you're unsure, consult with the tech. But with other sources, if it's something that you're not sure of, and then isn't that amount, maybe one or two, just document it internally, and then wait to see if it grows on the plate. Yeah. 
That's how when we report stuff like that. Then if it's wrong, then we have to make error corrections. We put the patient's welfare at risk. And I want to talk about real quick about the about the gram positive. Like let's say that you reported gram positive coxine clusters and you have a strep. Then not only you have to error correct it, but then you have to try to rule it out. You have to take all the steps, like go back to the original slide, see if there were actually gram positive coxine clusters. Perhaps repeat a slide, sometimes uh, resub the plates just to rule that out. So you went through all that trouble, you know, you potentially put the patient at risk. You wasted supplies because you had to rule out that organism. So all this is time consuming. But most important of all, you know, the patient was placed at risk. And then when you do your slide for your, you should also stain a, um, a slide for quality control just to make sure that the staining, like that the whole process worked. So some places they do, you know, they do it weekly, like the larger facilities where they do a lot of gram stains. And basically it's just, they use, you know, they make a, some of these are commercially prepared or you can make them in your lab. You know, you make, um, you inoculate a slide with, let's say with staph oreos on one side and then E. coli on the other. And that's your positive and your negative control. Some of the smaller facilities that they rarely do gram stains, it is recommended that they stain a quality control slide with each gram stain that they do. So every time a sample comes in and a gram stain is requested, they need to stain a quality control slide. But yeah, I mean, uh, I hope you enjoy this. I mean, a gram, gram stains, it's a very important tool. It saves time. It saves you from reporting something wrong, from getting in trouble. It's such, such a helpful tool. And that, my audience, is the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed, you know, um, listening about gram stains, such an important tool in the lab. Stay motivated, continue all that hard work. Thank you so much out there, all of you that contribute to healthcare in so many ways. All of you bacteriologists out there, all you microbiologists, you know, stay strong. Stay motivated. There's nothing better than a mound of plates to find out what's growing in them. I know I sound like a nerd, but it, it's so so amazing how much we can help and how many bacteria, uh, all the things that we can find in these plates. So it, it is amazing. So stay motivated. Always make sure you educate yourself. Many. There are many great resources out there. So I hope you have a great week. And thank you for listening to Let's Talk Micro. Goodbye.